So limerence also thrives in the face of adversity. And that mm. adversity could be external, Ooh. like there's some reason we can't be together or they couldn't express their feelings for me because I'm married or they're married or, or we speak different languages, something like that. Or it could be an internal, like an entirely internal adversity like, oh, I'm too shy or I'm just uh, you know, unable to speak to them or I'm too nervous or something. But it really thrives on that uncertainty. And so there tends to need to be some sort of reason why that uncertainty lasts longer. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we are talking about both the lovely and the dangerous sides of starting a new relationship. Perhaps you could say we're looking at the light side and the dark side of the Force on this day, May the 4th, be with you. Ah, oh, yes. There it is. In yes. addition to discussing new relationship energy, or NRE, we're also going to look at its dangerous Sith twin limerence. Specifically, we are going to look at what limerence is, how it differs from NRE, how it's being researched and used, and finally, some ways that you can move toward the more positive aspects of NRE and away from some of the pitfalls involved with falling in love or lust with someone new. Mm. Mm -mm. Well, I, I always love like... a Star Wars metaphor. <laughs> oh, of course. I'll never it's say no favorite. to that. <laughs> yeah. I feel like NRE is one of those low-hanging fruits of polyamory speech talk things. <laughs> polyamory like podcast topics, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Like like <laughs> jealousy. It's kind of similar in that fashion, but it is important to talk about. And uh, some of you out there may know what it is, NRE. <laughs> I'm sure many of our listeners know, but let's briefly go over what it is. So this term originated in Usenet postings in the 80s and 90s, and it's grown in prevalence since then. So I don't really know what Usenet is. Is that like like MySpace, but before MySpace? <laughs> of a fashion. In a, in a okay. sense. <laughs> Well, and you said that also the term polyamory came about around the same time, also on Usenet. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that... Whatever it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you explain to Emily and our listeners what Usenet is? Yeah, you're a little or older was? than we are, Jay. So, I mean, uh... yeah, like this is kind of before my time as well. Mm. But essentially what it is, is it was like a message board where you could post things, but this is before we had kind of centralized storage for the internet. So it was kind of this like decentralized way that different computers could be networked together. A lot of times these would be like at universities. Uh, and then also, you know, as we got into like the 80s and 90s, people could have home dial-in connections and stuff as well. But it was kind of like, I think the way it worked was that individual machines would store part of the information on it, or, or it would get saved somewhere and you'd have to call in to kind of retrieve the information but essentially all it boils down to is it's an early days of a message board right well, that's very really impressive. Like, that in internet terms impressive. may as well have been 200,000 years ago Got yeah it. pretty much <laughs> cool so there's so so the deal with nre is that it's not like an official psychological term it's not in a lot of dictionaries and so there's not a clear definition for it either however there is kind of I would say if you just sort of look at the different ways that it's used, particularly within the polyamory community, but it's also used now to describe all sorts of relationships. This is a definition that's on the Wikipedia page that I actually think is a pretty good kind of summary of it. So here it is. It's a state of mind experienced at the beginning of sexual and romantic relationships, typically involving heightened emotional and sexual feelings and excitement. NRE begins with the earliest attractions and may grow into full force when mutuality is established, and it can fade over a number of months or years. And we've mutuality. done a number of episodes 
diving into, let's say, the physiobiological basis of like what happens in your brain when what? NRE is happening. Yeah, uh, there is. Yeah, it's it's not just a, it's all in your head. It's it's like a chemical reaction mm-hmm. that takes place in your body. Yeah, I will say that I do wish more people outside of the non-monogamy community knew what NRE was or just knew that it was a term because I do find myself in like everyday situations wanting to refer to it and sometimes even Mm. referring to it and getting a blank stare (laughs) and then I need to explain what it is and I still get a blank stare and I feel bad and awkward. But I think it is so useful and it's really, there's nothing about it. every... Yeah. There's nothing about it that's every type of relationship. To to polyamory, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, it applies equally well to when people are starting out a monogamous relationship. Uh, It was originally used in the context of contrasting it with ORE, which, again, is also kind of an unofficial, undefined term. But some people define ORE as ongoing relationship energy or old relationship energy. So just kind of a mean way of putting it. (laughs) Ongoing is nice. That's like a nice little buffer around. (laughs) I think that's I think that's why people started using that. Yeah, Yeah, that's good. This old stale relationship (laughs) energy. Uh. (laughs) I like ERE, established relationship energy. Yeah, or it's just not really used widely. No, I, I tend to refer to it as just bonding because that's literally what it is, is that when we pass through NRE, what's on the other side of it, quite literally on the chemical level in our brains, is a, a shift to those bonding hormones. Hmm. And that I think that's what Yari is, is that we feel just more bonded to somebody, which is an energy all of itself that feels good, but it's a little bit different from how NRE feels. Generally, in this community and the way people talk about it is considered desirable depending on who you talk to i I do see some resources that are like oh god nre it's like such a terrible drug you know be careful it's a good drug but it's a terrible one (laughs) yeah yeah and so yeah caution is generally suggested when it comes to things like decision making of course like we always say on our show don't sign anything in the first year but NRE itself is not something that you need to avoid. It's it's not about don't fall in love with anybody. Don't let yourself feel these things. If you're feeling these things, that means something really terrible is going to happen. So it's it's not about, hey, cut off everything within you that is capable of feeling NRE. So now we're going to talk about limb rinse, which is something that I don't I had not heard about before this. I I had heard of limerence, and honestly, I thought it was literally the same thing as NRE. I thought limerence Uh. was just the scientific word for NRE. So when you're talking about these light sides and dark sides of the force, I don't know. This is new to me. Well, So when limerence was first presented to me, it was also kind of more of this general term for the same thing as NRE essentially. And Hmm. I I thought the same thing, that it was a technical term. Um, But over the years that it's been researched, the focus of that research has intentionally by the researchers shifted to focus more on the negative aspects of this. And we'll also see when we get into it how in some ways it's not just like the dark side of NRE. It's actually a slightly different thing, too. They just overlap a little bit. The concept of limerence first originated in Dr. Dorothy Tenov's research in the mid-1960s. Tenov coined the term limerence in 1977, publishing it in her 1979 book, Love and Limerence, The Experience of Being in Love. I I like that a lot. That's really a sweet title. I mean, bold, bold of this woman to repeat love twice in her book title. My goodness. Oh, I know. Yeah, Yeah, she used a word to it. Well, love is, it is gravitas, Mm. you know? It's true. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Uh Uh, There is no one definition, and it's changed a bit over time, but here's one from a different doctor, Dr. Lynn Wilmot. The definition is an involuntary, potentially inspiring state of adoration and attachment to a limerent object, L-O, not L-O-L, just L-O, involving (laughs) intrusive and obsessive thoughts, feelings, behaviors, from euphoria to despair, contingent on perceived emotional reciprocation. So that seems a little more like desperate love or something along Mm. those lines like the kind of love that i had in high school and college when i was really into someone and they could tell and so they broke up with me definitely had a collection of limerent objects in Mm -hmm. my life and objects 
That's the term. Well, that's that's the term. Uh, oh, L O L O L O L O L. Got it. You're yeah. Limerent object. Object. Love. Limerent. Love. 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 love, time. love, love. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's you know it's, it's just like say Dr. Dorothy Tenov. We repeat love a second time. So there you go. Or we just throw it in extra. You know, your limerent object love. Good. Lol. I could definitely tell from this definition. I would put this more in the Sith category. The, yeah. Right. Yeah. Just yeah. feels like okay. a very Anakin Skywalker thing to do. Mm, yeah. It, it mm. is kind of yeah. Mm. So okay, so some things to know about this. This was really interesting. Is that. Uh, this started out when this book was published. It was Limerence was a little bit more of a neutral to, you know, like sort of has some light side and dark side aspects to it. However, in the researchers who have succeeded her and who are continuing to research this, she's no longer alive. Um, but researchers who are still currently researching this have specifically been working to um, to focus it more on the negative aspects. Uh, essentially as like for therapists or people to recognize to then help treat for their patients. Um, so it has sort of become a little more focused that way. So if you out there listening are also someone who's heard of this being like, wait, I don't think this is supposed to be just negative, that that is sort of a, a thing that is intentionally sort of shifting in terms of what the term means. Wow. Some other things to realize is that this was originally studied strictly in the context of monogamous, heterosexual, allosexual relationships. Um, and the research still very much focused on monogamy um, and, and allosexual relationships, right? What's allosexual? Means, the opposite of asexual. Yeah, like, like not gray spectrum oh, at all. Got just, it, got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... And again, it's, you know, this is so common with a lot of psychological research where your your subjects you have are college students. Um, so it, you know, there tends to be some bias there. There has been some work, I think, to diversify this a little bit, but really limerence, even though it was coined in the late 70s, uh, is really not very widely studied yet. It's still like a fairly young concept, I guess, in psychological mm. terms. Um, but what I found in, in reading it, even though there's not research about this, but really when you are looking into it, and you'll see this in the episode, it applies equally well to non-monogamous relationships, asexual relationships. I actually found some really interesting blog posts specifically on an asexual uh, website that was talking about limerence um, or aromantic limerence. So it can apply to those things, but that's not really what's being researched. So just something to be aware of. Um, and then that, yeah, just I guess that last thing of reminding that in this context, we're talking about it mostly as a negative and potentially even dangerous thing. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, apparently some researchers even want to include limerence as a psychological condition in the DSM. And for our listeners who don't know, the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's a very, very, very controversial text that has been updated and revised many times over the years, um, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in not so good ways, but it essentially functions as the gold standard for determining what what do we count as a mental illness or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so some people want to include it as a psychological condition in the DSM. I don't necessarily want to throw my weight behind that being a thing because that seems like it needs a lot more research and consideration. The The term itself, limerence, is arbitrary. It was not derived from any previous word. Tenoff decided to use the word just because it sounded nice, essentially. That, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, to, yeah. to her and like two of her research students, they were like, oh, yeah, that sounds, sounds good. So she just kind of plucked it from the air, hmm. which is pretty fun. I, I am curious about how limerence as far as on this on the spectrum of when we're getting into like obsession and getting into like mental disorders like i was wondering you know in your research if you found is there an overlap or a connection with limerence and someone who has like erotomania or like obsessive love disorder or or things like that yeah the, the research is very much grouped in together with those things as well as like sex addiction um and then it's also grouped together with anxiety disorders and obsessive compulsive disorders. Oh, so it's kind of related to all those things. Um, depression is also related, but that's more of like a symptom of it. Uh, whereas 
anxiety disorders can kind of feed into limerence and, and vice versa. Again, it's it's really varies. Some of the studies looking at it, especially Dr. Tenov's research originally, was focused on this as this is a thing that almost everyone experiences, that like the vast majority of people experience, not as like, if you experience this, something's wrong with you, you have a disorder. I think in the same way that being a little bit obsessive or a little bit compulsive or a little bit anxious, anxious, those are also normal things. things. So yeah, with all of this, there is kind of this, we need to make a distinction between if we're at the level of like, this is a very serious clinical disorder that's really negatively affecting your life. That's something that you should seek some professional help with, particularly CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, has been shown to be effective with anxiety disorders as they relate to limerence. So anyway, that's something to look into if at any point in this episode you're hearing this and going, yikes, this is me, and also this is this is very serious. I need some help with this. Um, then definitely check that out. Um, but if it's not, keep in mind that this is something that most people experience to some degree at various points in their life. So it's not like you're broken if you feel these things. Yeah, it feels like so many of the things that we talk about on the show, it's like, okay, if this is debilitating in your life and really making it more difficult for you to go about your day-to-day tasks, then yes, perhaps seek some professional help. But Otherwise, yeah, all of us, it happens to all of us. Mm-hmm. It certainly did happen to me in the past. Woo. Uh, anyways, so different researchers have slightly different takes on limerence, and none of them really address consensual non-monogamy, at least not that we found in researching. Uh, so you may find some variety in online articles, but we're going to do our best to sort of cover an overview while also including a non-monogamous context for these ideas and for what we're going to talk about. Yeah. So the point of this in pointing out the difference between limerence and NRE is, again, just to be helpful for you. Again, it can't be overstated. If you're feeling something that's more on the limerence side, it doesn't mean that something is necessarily wrong with you. It's common feelings. But it can be helpful to learn to identify and distinguish them from maybe the more positive or helpful experience of NRE, just so that we can all of us individually avoid unnecessary suffering or making choices that will negatively affect our own lives or the lives of others. Yeah. So let's get into some of the key components of limerence, kind of what makes it up. And then a little bit later, we'll get into specifically contrasting it with NRE. But I think some of that will come up as we go through these as well. So the first one is uncertainty. So limerence tends to focus on the desire for a relationship with someone without knowing if that's reciprocated. So that's also something that's a little bit different from NRE. Um, Mm. This could be a question of whether they're into you at all, or it could be a Mm. question of, are they interested in me the same way? Uh, Although that's less common, the research tends to be more about that you know, I, I really long for this person, but I, I, for some reason, feel like I can't tell them that. And so I don't know how they feel about me. So I'm having to guess, right? I'm having to like read into their subtle interactions of what, what does that mean? Do they, I think maybe they like me, maybe they don't. I don't know. What that occurred? This is just a little uncomfortable, uncomfortable just because it's bringing up all my memories of my terrible limerence experiences, mm, honestly, yeah. and all the embarrassing, oh. awful things that I did. Um, I've, uh, yeah, this kind of uncertainty piece really strikes home, particularly from times that I've been trying to date people uh, who speak a different language than I do. Mm. Like particularly like when I'm dating in Japan mm. sometimes, yeah. like I've developed some crushes on people where our only common language is Japanese, which I'm, you know, co- maybe conversationally fluent in, but not 100% fluent in. And, and it's also just very different cultural and social cues. And so, yeah, yeah I've definitely found myself in situations of like, I don't know if I can even ask this question if they're interested, because <laughs> maybe that'd be super rude. I don't even know what's the best way to ask it in a proper way linguistically. So it wouldn't come across as weird. And so I just can't ask. And so I'm just going to sit in this uncertainty wondering what the heck is going on with this person. Sounds pretty tough. And yes. that's actually, yeah, exactly it. So limerence also thrives in the face of adversity. 
And that hmm. adversity could be external. Ooh. Like there's some reason we can't be together or they couldn't express their feelings for me because I'm married or they're married or, or we speak different languages, something like that. Or it could be an internal, like an entirely internal adversity like, oh, I'm too shy or I'm just uh, you know unable to speak to them or I'm too nervous or something. But it really thrives on that uncertainty. And so they're tends to need to be some sort of reason why that uncertainty lasts longer. This is like kind of a wacky example, but do, I don't know if you know the Stephen Sondheim show Assassins. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, this reminds me of John Hinckley, like being yes. super in love with Jodie Foster. Yeah, that, that came up in the mm. Limerence Wikipedia article. Oh, yeah. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it's uh, it, it, that's how, unfortunately, I feel that it's characterized with certain people um, in in our film and television, too, because I mm -hmm. thought of Glenn Close immediately in oh, that Fatal one. Attraction. Right. That's the well, one. Well, yes. let's be fair that most like mental disorders or mental health issues are not really given a fair shake by no, the film and TV I industry. I agree with you. So. Yeah. And so I think that there's something to be said there about this as well and just how like certain people are characterized to these extreme places mm -hmm. with stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I so, mean, an example that's less vilified is, like, Dedeker just rewatched the Great Gatsby movie recently, the Baz Luhrmann one, and that very mm. much, Gatsby's got that whole limerent thing going on with his LO, his limerent object, being... With uh, what's uh, her... The green light? <laughs> the green light. <laughs> the green lantern. <laughs> What's her name? I Ryan Reynolds. Daisy. 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 <laughs> yeah, Carrie Mulligan's character. Yes, Carrie right? Mulligan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that type of thing of like that that idea of like holding a candle out for someone and not quite knowing if they feel the same way, even though like you've interacted with them, maybe there have been mm -hmm. some indications, but there's oh, still God, been there, that uncertainty that, that could yeah. last like in that case, someone's entire life. Several years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Another key part of limerence is intrusive thinking as well as an intense longing for reciprocation. So like the start of many relationships, this can start just as initial feelings of attraction, just as a crush or a squish or whatever you want to call it, depending on how you identify. But then it can grow into something that's a little bit more obsessive. And, you know, I don't want to make it sound like it's necessarily the person's fault because sometimes it comes down to just thoughts of the limerent object or the person that you're attracted to just being persistent and intrusive. And you don't necessarily have control of that. You know, I don't think when, when someone gets obsessed with something or somebody, I don't know if they necessarily directly choose, Oh, this mm. is what I'm going to do. And it's going to be great. Mm. Uh, it may be point. characterized by fantasies that are grounded in reality. So this is in contrast to things like sexual fantasies or daydreams that can be a little bit more fantastical, less less likely to play out in real life. But it could be fantasies like, you know, swooping in to do something for the limerent object. I don't know how I feel about using this limerent object. It's a little bit funny. No, it's but what's used to, in all the to research. objectify someone truly yeah. like in that way. That's odd. Yeah. Uh, the limerent so, yeah. target. The LT. The limerent. The lim. The, the LTE. LTE, yeah. The, uh, I don't know. I'm just going to try to sprinkle in just maybe making a little bit more human. Uh, so okay. just like saving the person that they're thinking about and then finally their per you know, this person loves them in return. Or the person that they're obsessed with, obsessed with proclaims their love in a climactic moment, sometimes even as climactic as like, you know, cinematic as like, oh, when they're dying in my arms, you know, which <laughs> is a little bit finally intense. tell me. Yeah. I mean, that, that and that's straight up from Les Mis, right? Like with oh, all with these Ebony. things. Ebony. All so, over, so many things. Oh, it's all, all over, over the movies place. And books yes. and plays and, yeah. and that's why it's so fascinating that people are like, oh, well, this is the, the, the direction that the research is going is talking about this as a disorder. I guess it only is when it gets to a certain point or that that this is an issue I actually when it think becomes it a lot obsessive. Of sense. Yeah. I think but part I think, of our over romanticizing of it is part of what's made this more sure. of a problem. Yeah, that's Maybe. the thing. Is yeah, I think yeah. that it's a little bit fuzzy because socially and culturally we I think we have a hard time determining 
what's the line where it crosses into unhealthy? That because in so much of our media does romanticize and encourage these like unhealthy versions of it. And mm-hmm. I like to believe that maybe that's getting better, especially as culturally we get better understandings of, let's say, consent. But we have this long cultural history of yep. making this really romantic, really troublesome behaviors. And and so I don't know. So that's going to be the hard thing is is finding out where that line actually is. But ultimately, to to rope it back to this intrusive thinking that there can be this sense that all thoughts or events seem to link back to this particular person, the limerent object, in some particular way. So before we go on to talk about the rest of limerents and then comparing and contrasting with NRE and talking about some ways you can help guide yourself into more positive relationships, we're going to take a quick break to talk about how you can support this show, help keep this content coming to y'all for free. Please give it a listen and support our sponsors because that directly helps us. Alrighty, and now we're going to continue talking a little bit more about limerence. So limerence also includes fear of rejection, especially extreme shyness in the presence of the limerence person, the limerence object, the limerence target <laughs> I, what if we said the limer well if we say limerent person it sounds like the person who's feeling limerent the limerie. that's true oh yeah the limerie, the limerie. That, i like that's that. good that's okay good. let's yeah, try we'll that. that we'll try yeah. it on limerie, lim, limerie, lim, <laughs> there's a lot of that well a lot of film and television today okay um also exaggeration of the limerie <laughs> ability to only see the admirable quality admirable qualities of the limery oh, boy yes that mm-hmm. is very true mm-hmm. either avoid seeing the negative traits or even rendering them into another positive attribute yeah that that's what i find so fascinating that thing yes of, it's not just that i'm ignoring the negative things but i'm actually sort of turning them into a positive thing and i have absolutely done this before oh yeah yeah <laughs> So We're all like, oh, times. yikes. And ability to invent reasonable explanations for why any action might be a sign of hidden desire from the limery. So, yeah, if they're kind of like, nah, man, but you're still like, no, but they love me. Or well, something. I guess it's like, the kind of thing of just to pull an example out of the air, not like I've ever been here or anything. <laughs> come on. Like, come on. I feel like it, out of the three of us, you would be the one like in most in control of the situation. Oh, and, I don't and, know about plus, that. Plus I've just seen so many people in love with you that I'm like, yeah, everyone just loves her. I think I just hide it well. Got it. But <laughs> I, I think, you know, you're texting with this person and uh-huh. they stop responding to your texts. Ugh. For like God, a day. It's the worst. And it could be, I mean, so many different explanations come up, right? You know, but it's it, definitely it like could be they're, they're not, not that into you. It could be they you. just got busy. It could be they straight up forgot. It could be they didn't get the notification. It could be, if I'm talking with my most limerent self, it could be that he actually got a little bit freaked out by things getting too intimate too quickly. And so he pulled away because he, you know, he feels that for me too. And he wants to kind of make sure that we're going about things slowly. Like, your mind can really mm. interpret things quite creatively. Yeah, mm-hmm. indeed. Yeah, and like Emily, you were saying that it tends to be, it tends to thrive in uncertainty. So if someone's like, mm-hmm. I absolutely do not like you and never want to be in a relationship with you. You're like, well, I right. <laughs> That's actually very likely to end the limerence. Eventually, yeah. it might take a little while, but that's actually like- For some a, people. Well, I think then we're getting into something a little bit different like in I delusion think the ambiguity, if we're truly not thinking that yes but in the research no, I on think limerence the ambiguity, exactly yeah that like one of the ways to get out of limerence is to have like just a clear they don't like me now i can move on that is kind of one of the ways that they talk about being able to get over it so i think yeah let's not go too far into like i don't know the whole like no means yes territory i think that's maybe another darker thing that's a little bit different from just limerence no yeah for me in the past that ambiguity of like will will they won't they is the thing that really caused me to maybe hold on hold out hope for that carrot yeah some of, yeah, exactly. somewhere off in the distance yeah that limerent carrot I, maybe that's indeed. what it is it's the, a limerent carrot there you go. for some reason LC. that feels less lcd does that feel less objectifying yes. 
Yeah. If they're yeah. a carrot instead of an object. Your LCD it's a tasty sound system. Treat. <laughs> yes, it's a tasty <laughs> treat. Okay. I there are also physical symptoms that can happen, like shortness of breath, aching in the chest, perspiration, heart palpitations. All of these things are really funny because I, I feel like people experience in them when they are in NRE as oh, well yeah. from mm-hmm. time to time. Yes. Yeah. Or yeah, like when you're in throes of love initially, you're like, oh my God, I can't <laughs> I, I'm just so obsessed with this person. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then the last kind of major category we'll talk about is just the intense hope and intense despair or like the euphoria and depression that you'll kind of oscillate back and forth between with this. So part of this is that limerence needs these small doses of hope. Right. That's why I was saying if there's this clear, I'm not interested at all, or if you just have no contact at all, which is harder in our modern day, but if you just have no contact at all with the limerent object, um, that that it will kind of tend to go away, usually, Um, you know, just tends to go away without that. But those little bits of encouragement, like you were saying, Emily, that just that little bit of, oh, they did something nice this one time. It's like, ooh. Maybe there's hope there. Maybe, maybe they they're like not me. intending to lead you on, but because you're, or you're, maybe they are, or maybe they are. But either way, you're in that state of like you're so eager for those little crumbs, and so you're gonna grab at those, and and then you have that intense joy when it feels like maybe my feelings are reciprocated, and then this intense despair when it feels like they're not. Um, similar to addictive patterns, just in general, right? Is that that feeling of wanting it so badly, the euphoria of getting it, and then the depression of not having it, and kind of that cycle. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Oof. This is the real emotional roller coaster. Know, this, <laughs> really? yeah, this is an, an emotional it, episode, yeah. It makes me think of so many things. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think of, um, I learned once upon a time that there was like this old superstition or this old belief that if you ate ant eggs with honey it could make you fall out of love and when i first read that first i was like a gross and then b that's weird why why would who would be wanting to fall out of love necessarily but thinking back on my experiences that are a little bit more this limerent side Mm -hmm. this like ups and downs and swinging back and forth that intense hope intense despair i could if someone had offered me some ant eggs with honey and was like, this may help, I would have swallowed it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, there's other cultures that eat <laughs> ant eggs. We can't, we can't poo-poo okay, it too true. much. No, I, yes. I was wondering if it was, it must not have been an American thing that I know of. Not maybe. that I know of. Although yeah. maybe these cultures, no one is in love with anyone ever. <laughs> they're just oh, eating ant eggs all the time. That would be great. Probably yeah. not. Or they're just not in love with those that don't serve them well. Hmm. Yeah, God, like, gosh, that'd be I would nice. like that, right? <laughs> that'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be cool. I would like to go to my past <laughs> self and be like, yeah, you didn't need to go there with a lot of these people. Have some ant eggs, Yikes. real quick. Yeah, yeah. please. <laughs> Maybe I would have done it too. The least vegan thing I can offer you: ant eggs know. mixed with honey. And but honey, just yeah. take yeah. it. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's spend some time comparing this again to NRE and a little compare and contrast because there are some. Similarities. So according to the research, both NRE and limerence tend to be shortish term, you know, from the research we read anywhere from six months up to three years for NRE slash limerence in most cases uh, tends to be. And I'm assuming that this is kind of like three years provided the situation is staying fairly stable. Right. We're still getting these little doses of like yeah. hope maybe along the way that, that yeah. sustain it. One of the le- limerence researchers said their studies found three years on average for limerence, Ooh, boy, which I was average. surprised at how long that is with some lasting decades um, and some being like Gatsby. short, like just wow. a few months. Yeah. So it's I don't know. I don't know what to I don't know what to make of that. But they're both generally shortish. Right. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. OK. Both of them can feel exciting and slightly addictive. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think that is, it is part of the joy of NRE is this feeling like you can't get enough of somebody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's such a rare thing, you know, and that only lasts for a short period of time. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing for it to feel slightly addictive, I think. In both cases, 
it can dominate a lot of your thoughts. And in both cases, you know, these both happen to a large percentage of people, not necessarily everybody. And in both cases, both limerence and NRE can put a strain on existing relationships if you're non-monogamous. I think it can also put a strain on relationships yeah. if you're monogamous. Yeah, and, different kind of strain, gosh. but yeah. Yeah, it's on your friends or your family yeah. members, people who are like sick of hearing you talk about this person, like. <laughs> It's definitely My mother literally said that to me before. Like, just you need to stop talking about this person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Whoa, or okay. or I mean, limerence in the research also does come up a lot with someone who's married, but starts to experience limerence mm. for someone else, or right. that someone else is married. So it can yes. you know can cause strain in a lot of ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, and in both cases, you know, you tend to focus on only the good, attractive qualities of the other person. In both cases, you may have a harder time or a fuzzier time being able to see their negative traits or red flags. Yeah. So Just why we say don't make any important decisions, especially don't sign anything in that first year, although maybe up to three years, it turns out. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the differences between each. So Okay, between NRE and limerence. So limerence is based in uncertainty, while NRE is usually based on mutual excitement. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, NRE usually happens when you are absolutely like in a relationship or in the throes of a sexual relationship or something with someone else, for There's sure. There's a sense of the, the other person reciprocating. Yeah. Right? yeah, absolutely. Limerence is generally described as having much lower lows in between periods of really extreme highs. And yeah. I, I would definitely agree with that, that there are more, there's more turbulence mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. in NRE where it kind of is just like this baseline really high feeling for maybe months or up to a year or so. Yeah, or like the lows when you're not with that person, it's more of this like, oh, this is frustrating rather yeah. than like, oh, God, they don't love me. I'm so sad. You know, like it's yeah. there's a different quality that the lows aren't quite the same degree of low. Mm -hmm. Limerence is also usually more secret, at least from potentially the other person involved, like you may be secretly pining for them. Mm -hmm. Or the hints that you or they are giving are more subtle. Than in I, NRE. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. If you're feeling like there's, for some reason, I cannot directly communicate with this person, or I can't directly ask them if they're into me. Mm -hmm. Or I, I'm just there too is nervous that, too. Or, or I'm just too nervous yeah. or whatever. There's more of that pressure to kind of keep it secret. Yeah. yeah. And in addition to being more emotionally painful for the person experiencing limerence, it can also lead to uncomfortable situations and or confusion for the limerence person limery the limery sometimes, the limerent object yeah sometimes even it can be a little scary for them like I, I really really do not want this person's affections yeah yeah and it and it makes sense and this is one of those ones that for me thinking back is just like yikes like how many times have i maybe mm -hmm. felt really strongly about someone but been nervous or not able to talk to them about it or something and i've kind of had to interpret in my head are they into me or not and some of those have led to like a very weird uncomfortable situation then where like i'm proclaiming my feelings and thinking that that they are going to reciprocate and they don't because all that was in my head leading up to it and now they're really uncomfortable and weird feeling as opposed to you know, having some sort of a more direct communication about it earlier and not trying to do all this like mind reading, reading between the lines type of a thing. And that's kind of where it not only negatively affects you, but can also make the other person, the one who supposedly you like a lot, feel shitty. Yeah. I feel like as a society, we would benefit so much from being able to have real co communication with each other, like being taught how to communicate with each other from a young age better than we have <laughs> yeah. been taught in the past because i feel like so many young people go through this and and you know people that are not young but but the times when i can recall this happening were when i was young and there is that potential that like you're going to scare someone or you're going to maybe even you know more nefariously move into territory where it's really like you're you're causing harm to another person in some way. Yeah. And yeah. 
yeah, I mean, <laughs> something should be done about that. So I'm glad that people are researching it, but I think it needs to start like from a smaller more baseline level of like let's communicate better everyone yeah. a jedi academy that's what yes. i'm ah, okay to make back. sure that we train up Love our little it. younglings in the ways of the force that are yeah. good and good for the universe and that is a perfect segue into our last section of this episode which is our mini jedi academy crash course <laughs> on what to do he's too old no He's too old to begin the training. <laughs> he, is. he is. But maybe some of you out there are not. Let's do this. <laughs> so, all right. So any potential new relationship will likely bring some aspects of NRE and limerence with it, especially in the early phases before you've established more clear and direct communication with this person when it's just kind of getting started or maybe you've just found yourself being interested in someone. So the question is, what can we do to help ensure that we follow a healthier path and not get sucked into the dark side of the force to not be, mm -hmm. you know, seduced by the dark side, by the Sith. Mm -hmm. So as we've said before, limerence thrives on uncertainty. And one of the best things that you can do to deal with uncertainty is to communicate to the best of your ability you can do your best to be clear about your feelings and know that if they aren't interested, it's okay. And you've potentially saved yourself from a lifetime of suffering. That that's sounds like dramatic. Right. Yeah, that's fairly dramatic. But... At the very least, six more months of suffering, you know? like It could feel like a lifetime. It could feel like a, li but a lifetime's worth of F. suffering. Scott Fitzgerald, and then it is kind of like decades of suffering. And, and then decades you know, of suffering, but then the you become the book. a, a super... Well, but not if you're F. Scott Fitzgerald and you create some successful novels, but I'm not going to make a case for being limerent right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Meditation has been shown to limit the negative effects of limerence, mostly by helping you to be more just aware of the thoughts that are going on in your head rather than letting them dictate or, or control you. Uh, same reason why CBT is also helpful for these kind of things. So yeah. yes, meditate like a Jedi. Yeah, oh, you're right. Uh, is also to talk to someone about it, preferably if you're non-monogamous, to not talk to your partner about it. Not because like you should keep it from them necessarily, but that you just don't want to <laughs> – it's just as much as possible on this show. We try to encourage people not to rely on your romantic partner to be your only source of support and processing and things like that. That's just a lot to ask of any one person. So – but the point of this is to talk to people about it specifically to try to get perspective. And that's different from talking to someone just because you want to like gush about how amazing this person is, but actually trying to get some perspective, some reflection, and actually listen to the reflection that you get back. I mean, still, you don't have to take everything any friend or partner says to you as like, oh, they're 100% right and I'm 100% wrong, but at least take it in and consider it, listen to it. Also, continue your self-care or maybe start some self-care if you haven't yeah. been doing that yet, right? Is when you're feeling limerence or NRE, it's easy to get so focused on that that you stop taking care of yourself. You stop doing your other hobbies or your interests or your other social engagements, things like that. Along with that, limerence can be increased when people are feeling lonely. And I think especially coming out of a pandemic, a lot of people might be suffering from some extra loneliness. Uh, the study specifically found that if your social needs are not being met, then you're more susceptible to falling into limerence. So just keeping that in mind and doing what you can to you know, maintain your social life and build social connections and maintain the social connections you do have, whoever that's with, you know, with your family, with online friends, with real life friends, you know, whoever that is. And remember that even though these feelings can be very strong and have a profound physical and mental effect, they're really just a natural byproduct of the ways we have evolved to bond and procreate and do things like that over the course of human evolution. And it doesn't mean that this person that you're super into is necessarily the one or that there's anything inherently magical about that person or your potential relationship with them. And if it does become something wonderful, 
then, you know, that'll be because of your good communication and your mutual compatibility, not because of your profound longing for them or your suffering in that longing or stuff like that. I mean, I, I'm i saying it like this because I've been there. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, there? tell that to 22-year-old Dedeker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is. She is. Are you kidding? Yeah. So what and- helped when I was that age was when my limerent carrot left town <laughs> to become a Girls Gone Wild cameraman. And that Whoa. dried up the limerence right away. Yeah. <laughs> Not because of that... him becoming the cameraman. It was more about the leaving town, actually, where he was just like gone and... Mm. We were not in touch. Like that was more the thing that that helped do the out of sight, out of mind. Got it. The girls gone wild cameraman is just kind of the cherry on top. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, that is actually just one one last thing to add on to the end of this is that in the research, um, they talked about essentially three ways to end limerence, three ways that limerence tends to end. One of them is consummation, or it's like finding out that it's mutual, and that then mm. the limerence transitions into NRE, or oftentimes actually just sort of dissolves and you're not that interested in the person anymore, which is a bummer. Oof a doof. That's a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> yep. So that's one way. The second way is what Dedeker talked about, which is they call starvation, where you basically just starve the limerence of that those little breadcrumbs that it was snatching up, that it mm. was feeding off of. Um, and then... The third way is finding someone else. And I'm not sure this is the healthiest approach for getting out of limerence, but it's either developing limerence for someone else or it's just getting into another relationship. Now, again, the studies were very monogamy focused. And so for them, it's like, oh, if you're into someone, obviously you're going to not be into this other person. But I do think there is something to it in having something else that's going to occupy part of your brain so that that kind of obsessive wanting something to chew on part of your brain isn't just so focused on this one thing. It's focused on someone else. So in that way, I don't know, maybe it's possible that non-monogamy might help make someone less susceptible to that quality of limerence. I don't know. I don't know. There's no research on it. We'll have to see. Hmm. Indeed. All right. So for our patrons, we're going to do a bonus episode where we're going to talk about the color wheel theory of love. It has a fun name. We're going to talk about what it is, what it's all about. It's something that's kind of fun, but not worthy of an entire episode. So we're just going to do a little bonus about it. And that'll be fun. So join us for that if you're interested. Also, we would love to hear from you. Had you heard of Limerence before this? Have you ever experienced it before? We're going to be posting a question on our Instagram. Please Join in there and share with other people about your experience with limerence. The best place to share your thoughts with other listeners about this episode is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Multiamory is created and produced by Dedeker Winston, Emily Matlack, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowark and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. <laughs>